Hello brothers, hello sisters. Uh, it's glad to uh, join in with you again and share what God has put in my heart and what he feels important to share with all y'all. And I hope this message may be fruitful. First, let's pray. Father God, we just ask that there's a full understanding in this and that it may produce fruit, that you anoint my lips and give me the words I need to say, that I would rely fully on you and and not my human understanding, and that uh, there will be just so much fruit produced through this and understanding, and may there be an increase, and may you increase as I de decrease. We just uh, seek to grow deeper in you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. All right, this is Walking a Counterfeit, part one. And we are going to start talking on the topic of belief and faith. And uh, we're going to start with Hebrews chapter 11. And uh, I'm not going to read everything of Hebrews 11, but I would much encourage y'all to study it and look at, you know, people actually living through faith. <clears throat> For Okay. So, faith is the confidence that what we hope for will actually happen. It gives us assurance about things we cannot see. Through their faith, the people in days of old earned a good reputation. By faith, we understand that the entire universe was formed at God's command. That what we see now did not come from anything that can be seen. I'm going to start with that. Um, see, the confidence, faith is the confidence that what we hope for will actually happen. And there's an action of actually living that way and living as this, if it exists, rather than getting tied up in the fear of different things, which fear in human knowledge is quite a counterpart to faith in reality um our understanding like when peter you know walked on the water he focused on jesus his faith was active but then his human knowledge said okay i'm on top of water i'm gonna drown and you know his mind went there and, and then he would may have drowned uh and he fell because of it our human knowledge and our understanding can get in the way of our faith and our walk. Um, you get into Revelation, it says, there will be a day where you won't be able to buy or sell. And Jesus talks about um, elsewhere that God feeds the birds um, and clothes the flowers. And we don't have to worry about those things. We can learn. There will be a day where we will have to learn to rely fully on Him. And, and what we believe in. Which is closer in the concept of trust. It's not merely believing God exists. But by faith, if God... We understand that the entire universe was formed by God's command. So He's in control of this entire thing. <coughs> Of what is good, of what reflects him, he's not in. He doesn't control the darkness. He's not about those things. Many people say, "Why does God allow this to happen?" But we realize that there's also an enemy that is not flesh and blood, one who tries to destroy what God is trying to create. He's trying to make things look bad. What God calls called good. But anyways, the entire universe was formed at God's command. That what we see now did not come from anything that can be seen. So we can trust that completely in what we cannot see. But so often, in our faith walk, we get so focused on what we can see 
that we are distracted by what we cannot and we make it as if God only moves through what we can see rather than moving through the powers of what we cannot see which he has given us the power to move through ourselves which explains the spiritual gifts <coughs> all right so um verse 5 it was by faith that Enoch was taken up to heaven without dying. He disappeared because God took him. For before he was taken up, he was known as a person who pleased God. He had faith. And it is impossible to please God without faith. Okay, so there goes into this. Oh, anyone who wants to come to him must believe that God exists. And that he rewards those who sincerely seek him. <coughs> so first, look. So it is impossible to please God without faith. But then it says anyone who wants to come to him must believe that God exists. So it's obviously showing faith and belief as two slightly different things. So we can believe God exists but not have faith. Right? So, uh, and we can't please them with it. So what's, what's that kind of look like? Well, first, what does James say? James shares <coughs> in verse 19 of chapter 2. You say you have faith, for you believe that there is one God. So you believe God exists. Good for you. Even the demons believe this and they tremble in terror. So first, if we are firmly saying, okay, I believe God exists, so I'm right with God and I'm saved and I'm going to heaven. That is, so demons are going to heaven too? There's no place of torture. I mean, every single person is going to heaven. That is what our mind is trying to say. Even demons who are constantly conniving and lying because God, the devil is the father of lies. And we are trying to say, well, I believe in God, so demons believe in God. I mean, they trembled at Jesus and his authority and power. They knew who he was. And yet, um, we think just because we believe exists. And that is part of the problem with taking out the Old Testament and saying, well, that's that's irrelevant. But Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Though he may not destroy us in this life and show that discipline of death like it does in the Old Testament, which he came back for, it does show... You know, um, sorry. Um, so you have faith, for you believe there is one God good for you. Even the demons believe this, and they tremble in terror. How, f um, so we're going to go back. So what's, what's this kind of look like? Um, my dear brothers and sisters. How can you claim to have faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ if you favor some people over others? First, you know, um, how, like it says in 1 John, how can you claim to love God if you do not love your fellow believers? So first, when we look at that, or you have favoritism, you know, um, If you have favor over some people, over the others, you know, um, there should be evidence. If we're showing favoritism and some people, we just say, well, they can't be saved. They're worthless. I'd rather choose these people rather than those people. I like these people. I want to cling to these people and ignore these people. And, and uh... Um, so we're going to go further. It says, 
What good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith but don't show it by your actions? This is verse 14. Can that kind of faith save anyone? Suppose you see a brother or sister who has no food or clothing, and you say goodbye and have a good day. Stay warm and eat well, but then you don't give that person any food or clothing. What good does that do? So obviously they're saying, merely claiming that God exists does not show evidence of being saved, nor does it mean you are. Because it, it's by faith that we please God. Um, and that, that goes, so goodbye, have a good day. So oftentimes we'll be like, okay, this person's almost going through this. I'll just pray for them. Okay, if God had you pass this person, you know you have something in your pocket or anything that you could help them, and yet they're just like, now yeah, just pray for them, and you don't help them at all, and you're just like, let's take take care. I'll pray for you. Um, really, what good is that? Well, you go home to your heat, and that person's out there freezing to death, starving, possibly at the point of death. And uh, you're in your... You have more than they do. And you can't find anything to help them. <coughs> so you see, faith by itself is, isn't enough. Unless it produces good deeds, it is dead and useless. So faith it should show the evidence that Christ is in us. Because faith points to the Father. But if it's not pointing to the Father and it's pointing to ourselves and we're not showing the action of, of, of our growth and and then it looks I mean it's not existence because as we grow, it should be showing because Christ is moving in us and disciplining us and doing different things within us and growing us and and all of that stuff, creating us to a new creation. The one who's making his appeal through us and moving us, it should be evident that he's going to be doing some stuff through us that's going to be like, oh, that's not humanly possible. What is that? It is God in us and God with us and we should see the evident of him through us and we should see the evident of us not being so selfish but us always serving others like Christ did because that's what he did anyway how can you show me your faith if you don't have good deeds I will show you my faith by my good deeds. So my faith is trusting in the in, in Christ. Say I have very little but I believe God's going to take care of me and I trust in him. I can risk giving that up that little bit up to provide for that person because I have faith that God's going to provide for me. And and as he sees us, we say, you know, what you're faithful with, with little, you'll end up with much. You know, he's watching us and seeing how we move through that. Um, anyways. <coughs> Can't you... Uh, don't you remember that our ancestor Abraham was shown to be right with God by his actions? when he offered his son Isaac on the altar. You see, his faith and actions worked together. His actions made his faith complete. See, to explain his faith and actions, he's not going to this typical, like, hey, look, I did good deed, or I gave this away, or I did that for that person. No, it is going beyond. It's going, I heard God's voice. He told me to do something that seems 
very impossible and that's something completely against my nature and my understanding and my mind like sacrificing your own son but trusting this is what God wants he's seeing where your heart's going to align with the world or with God who do you love more and who gave you by faith like it says God created everything by his command by faith he created that child and Abraham knew that and and he had the ultimate say on his life and Abraham trusted that but in his heart he knew he had to do what God said and he had faith that that something good was going to come out of it and he will be rewarded and that his son will be okay <coughs> but just because you know it has to be God's call through your relationship he'll talk to you tell you don't go and try to sacrifice your son and try to be like you know God told me to he doesn't go work through sacrifice because Jesus was the ultimate sacrifice which is the contrast to what Abraham did so don't we are no longer under the sacrificial system to cleanse ourselves through sacrificing an animal or any of that but Abraham you know God provided the lamb he didn't want him to strike his son but he wanted to see he tested his faith anyway and he will test our faith it is by that you see his faith and his actions work together and his actions made his faith complete so he will look and show us you know it's beyond the impossible faith is beyond what you can see and, and fathom and we don't fully comprehend that anyways um and so it happened just as scriptures say abraham believed god and god counted him as righteous because of his faith so he's counted righteous which <coughs> because he trusted him in an impossible situation and, and cling to him and did exactly what he said anyway so you see we are shown to be right with god by what we do not by faith alone it's the evidence of trusting in Him. I mean, you have all these good deeds that you can do and you don't need God for. It. It's not going to show the evidence of the impossible or what you can see. And that that's meaningless. That's nothing. It doesn't mean you're saved or anything else because you do a couple good works. Because we're going to get into that a little bit later. Um... Rahab, the prostitute, is another example. She was shown to be right with God by her actions when she hid those messengers and sent them safely away by a different road. <coughs> Rahab did just even more than that. It says that her home was connected to the wall. And the wall was getting, she knew one way or another for them to get into the into Jericho the wall would have had to be destroyed one way or another but she stayed in her home and trusted she did not leave it at all that first off is faith a typical person would leave but that's where we really see faith in the play and she hid she trusted these men were from God and that's that's <coughs> part of the reality um, hold on. Anyways, um, reality it is when you see Christ in one another. And and you're working with one another, and 
just growing in such love and in such a way that shows evidence you know uh, of Christ in you how how we're treating one another regardless of whom they may be even if they may be our enemies because that's not a typical human response and faith goes, dies deep into a non-typical response. Uh, we're going to go back to Hebrews. <clears throat> so, uh, 1 to 3, 5, 13 through 16 in Hebrews 11. All these people <coughs> died still believing what God had promised them. They did not receive what was promised, but they saw it all from a distance and welcomed it. They agreed that they were foreigners and nomads here on earth. That's the first step. You understand and you agree. I am a foreigner. I'm not going to act or think or, you know, turn to the things that the world does. But I'm a foreigner. I rely on Christ. And his message and what he says. Regardless of what's coming at me. Obviously people who say such things are looking forward to a country they can call their own. If they had longed for the country they came from, they could have gone back. But they were looking for a better place, a heavenly homeland. That is why God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. They lived not by, <coughs> you know, the tangible or, in, you know, desiring to go to any certain place and be content. They wanted to connect to God and be heavenly minded and, and focus on that. They longed. For this heavenly homeland, this place with God, to be connected to God, in harmony in God, to please God. And that's why God is not ashamed to be called their God. But merely believing God exists and doing nothing with it. Jesus says, you deny me, I will deny you before my Father. Then God will be ashamed of you. And Jesus, you know, we live this, um, and like we said, we pray. Uh, actually, I will go into, before I speak on that. Um, Luke 18. Well, Jesus says, don't babble on like the Gentiles do, but pray like this. So so we can focus and pray over and over and over. And, and that's not fully trust. Actually, we're going to get into that. So let's not go too far into that yet. But anyways, uh, Luke 18, it says, One day Jesus told his disciples a story to show that they should always pray and never give up. Always pray in every circumstance for all people, no matter what you're going through. There was a judge in a certain city. He, was, he said, who neither feared God nor cared about people. A widow that, of that city came to him repeatedly, saying, Give me justice in this dispute with my enemy. The judge ignored her for a while. But finally he said to himself, I don't fear God or care about people. But this woman is driving me crazy. I'm going to see that she gets justice because she's wearing me out with her constant requests. Then the Lord said, Learn a lesson from this unjust judge. 
even he rendered a just decision in the end. So don't you think God will surely give justice to his chosen people who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will grant justice to them quickly. But when the Son of Man returns, how many will he find on the earth who have faith? First, yeah, it's good to pray and seek God's will. Or, no, sometimes we pray and we are seeking our own will. And that gets into Jesus saying, uh, many come to me, say, I prophesied in your name, I, I cast out demons in your name, I perform many miracles. Um, but those who actually do the will of my Father, he says. And then he says, I never knew you. Get away from me, you work as a lawlessness. <coughs> so we see that uh, we can constantly pray and ask these requests. Like, like this judge, he's a man who doesn't fear God or anything like that. But he's willing to respond. And even if we're not fearing God, I mean, when we're in distress, we see this through judges and, and Israel. I mean, they only call on God when they need something and then they turn away. They don't really care. They're basically using them. And eventually, God was like, you know, you know, because he's calling us to repent. But they constantly, and I think this is uh, Jeremiah they constantly, 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 he helps them, they deny him after it's done. They help him, deny, help him, deny, help him, deny. So they only use him when they need help, but then they ignore him and live how they want. And eventually he's like, I'm no longer going to help you. You constantly rebel after me helping you out timeless and time again. And... You know, the, the one of the main reasons why he understood that is because the Old Testament shows this contrast of life relying on ourselves to achieve God or heaven. Because Christ is not there yet and we can't rely on him in us. <coughs> and so the persistent window... Um, so how many, when he returns, turns, we may ask and ask and ask and ask and ask and ask. And then he's like, but when I return, and I'll listen. But when I return, how many actually have faith? Because it says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. So, we live constantly giving him requests. Which are mainly when we just need them. And it is so easy. So easy. To believe in God when it's easy. To call upon his name and, and, and say, okay, I want to be a Christian. I, I want Jesus in my heart. That's easy while it's easy. But that doesn't mean that's a reality. Remember. It's. In Romans, it says, um, If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. But what does it say <coughs> in Jeremiah 17? The heart is most deceitful of all. The human heart is most deceitful of all. Who knows how desperately wicked it is. So in reality, as we read that, just because at a time, well, it's easy, does it actually mean that in our heart we fully believe this message? And what is that message? Well, back to we can believe God exists, but in reality it says the message of the cross is foolish to those who are perishing. So if it says the message of the cross is foolish to those perishing, 
then what's the message of the cross? It's that Jesus came and died for sinners. So first off, if you can't accept in yourself that you are a sinner, that you need God, and you need to repent and change your ways, if you cannot find that in your heart, and, and if that message was not given to you, and that you have this workspace message, uh, as it says here, so Israel, they were destroyed in their unbelief. And that is a warning to us, as it says in Corinthians. But <coughs> they followed Moses, who was following God. They created God. See, that's, that's the thing I was going to say earlier about the Old Testament. Idols. We don't understand that they created God. Gods in a form. They believed in a higher power. But they created them in an image that suited their life. And, and they worshipped these statues they created. Um, and, and called it their God. Um, and if we, we don't understand that because we try to stick with New Testament. So we don't understand this concept of we can create God into anything and it not be the true God. So how are we confessing with our mouth? The G First off, Jesus is Lord. That's in every situation. Confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. He's the one who's controlling me. Not my circumstance, not 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 my emotions, not my mind, not my old way of thinking, not what the world says, not, 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 not. But Jesus is my Lord. He is the one who's over me and can control me and is over my life and death. And believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. And this is constant, constant confessing. It's easy within the four walls while you're full of emotions and stirred up. And a safe, secure place that you may just go to either go to heaven, which isn't about God. And remember... That unbelief got Israel destroyed. Or it's a positive area to get out of your bad situation. Or that that you're using to overcome it. it, it it's, it's an attempt. Or you just grew up that way and you're told to go there. But your heart's never in it. It's just something you're conditioning your mind. Which most of the things that we do is just condition our mind. Even if it's not actually here. <laughs> Which doesn't actually mean it's a reality of what we actually believe and understand. It's just something we're conditioned to. So we don't actually have a relationship or understand God. But rather he's a concept in our mind to make us feel in a secure area and place. Also, okay. So. <coughs> Romans 9. Even though the Gentiles were not trying to follow God's standards. <coughs> They were made right with God. And it was by faith that, that this took place. For first, the Gentiles didn't grow with the law of God. They didn't understand any of that. They were sinners. They did not know the way of God. And they lived this way. <coughs> but they heard the message of God. And they received it. By faith. Okay, I can be accepted, even if I didn't do this, this, or that. Then he can make me blameless in his sight. And that's part of the message of the cross, that uh, I was a sinner. I realize I'm a sinner. I need God. And these other people are sinners. And, and, and we're all separated from God, and we desperately need him, and he created a way through his death, by his blood, that he can cleanse us, that he will pour out his spirit, and this is more part of it, and he can give us power to live through this life, that's part of it that we're missing, and uh, if you claim you believe, but you say that some people don't deserve God's grace, you are not actually of God.
you're not actually of God because that is against the message of the cross that he died for all people all people and by believing in him you and and what he did for all sinners that we are all separated from God at a time you must accept that message otherwise your belief in God means nothing and is no different from the demons anyways <coughs> But the people of Israel, who tried so hard to get right with God by keeping the law, never succeeded. Why not? Because they were trying to get right with God by keeping the law, instead of by trusting in Him. There, that's what's missing. That's the key. We are trying to, we, we can grow with this belief of God, but that's also against the message. We cannot reach God by the law or good deeds but by faith in Christ to do it through us the incredible remarkable things that we can't even perceive with our mind that we kind of erase in the Bible you must believe all of his message everything in his word he says this is how I created relationships marriage between man and woman this is how I set things up. This is what I say is wrong. This is how you're going to overcome this. I say that you're blameless in the sun, in my sight because of my blood, my son's blood, and that you can be cleansed from it. You trust in that. You have faith that I did that through you, that I can cover you, and I can cover you in all situations, and rather life or death, that you just cling to me, and, and you will still have life. Um... <coughs> but yeah by trusting in him but if we try to pursue God by keeping the law just like Israel just like the Pharisees it's I never knew you your belief is meaningless absolutely nothing then that's not going to get you saved no matter how much you walk it, no matter how much good deeds you do, you, we, Jesus did not, we're not saved by the, our works. And, regardless of what some religions say, we don't all believe in the same God. Not every religion. I mean, some of the religions that even say that. That, well, every path will get you to heaven. Even though Jesus says there is only a narrow path. And, and many are on the wide path. But we have made, we have decided in our mind how narrow, how wide the narrow path is. We've kind of made it longer. And some churches pretty much, some denominations pretty much say, well, uh, um, all beliefs will get you in heaven. Even if they will mistreat you and look down on you. Because you don't believe and follow the same way they do. And yet they will have the audacity to try to say, Well, all beliefs will get you up there, but you should act this way. That's a hypocrite. That's exactly what the Pharisees did. Although, a little different because they said you have to be this. Uh, they teamed up with other religions. Anyway. So by trusting him. Not by keeping the law. Many people are trying to keep the law. And their focus is on their human effort to reach God. And they will push that. Even if they know it's by faith. <coughs> okay. So back to Hebrews. 11. Um, so here's further, if we, so it's, like I said, when it's easy, it's easy to claim God, but look at what they dealt with. Okay. So Hebrews 10, it says, think back on those early days when you first learned about Christ. So look at their situation. It says, remember how you remained faithful even though it meant terrible suffering. 
Sometimes you were exposed to public ridicule and were beaten. And sometimes you helped others who were suffering the same things. You suffered along those who were thrown into jail. And when all you owned was taken from you, you accepted it with joy. You knew there were better things waiting for you that will last forever. So do not throw away this confident trust in the Lord. Remember the great reward it brings you. Patient endurance is what you need now, so that you will continue to do God's will. Then you will receive all that he has promised. So look, they faced these sufferings and, and ridicule when they first believed. They believed when their life was in danger. Like I said, that's why Jesus says God will, or Paul says God will complete the good work. We could, all those people, they faced some stuff. Uh, and they received, some other people received Paul what? When he was sick, I mean, his body ailments, he uh, was beaten and whipped and, and mistreated. And and they st still received the message of Christ from the man when they saw, like, whoa, this could happen to me. I could get hurt like this. See, when you believe a message, when you're facing persecution, because Jesus himself said... You'll be hated, mocked, persecuted, mistreated, uh, lied about. The world will hate you. Now, if you actually knew that was part of the gospel and that you may go through sufferings that will help you grow. Because in our society, we believe, well, a Christian makes your life better. It makes you a good person. It makes you perfect. You got the message wrong. It's a wrong belief. That's not the truth. And people will come to it. It's like, oh, this is easy. I could do this. That's all I got to do to go to heaven. Okay. But in reality, it's if you believe the whole message. Everything. What God says and trust what he says and trust that this Galatians 5, Paul says, if you have any of these things, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. Look, are you going to receive that message? Are you going to receive the message when, like I faced, my brothers and everybody else, friends I used to hang out with, they don't receive me anymore. They don't really talk to me. When you're around certain people and you feel like you have to hide that whole part of yourself and you don't feel loved or accepted, I, if, if you knew all of those things would happen. You, David, he was ran from his own son and from Saul and he had to live in a cave and, and went through all these things and he still received God. Elijah had to be fed by ravens and and he also lay, lived in the cave for a little bit separated from everybody possibly depression and other things but he still lived by God if you knew if you looked at the word and knew that you may your life may be in danger for this would you really believe the message and receive Christ in your heart. It's easy to say when everything is peaceful, when you could say, I can believe whatever religion I want and I could be totally fine. What if you actually was given conviction and say, you, this is what God wants to do in you. He wants to change this out of you. You can't be like this. You might face this. If that was part of the message, will you believe? Further in Hebrews 11. Okay. <clears throat> Remember, your leaders. Oh, sorry, I jumped a little bit. 
All right. How much more, verse 32 of 11, how much more do I need to say? It would take too long to recount the stories of the faith of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and all the prophets. By faith, these people overthrew kingdoms, ruled with justice, and received what God has promised them. They shut the mouths of lions, quenched the flames of fire, and escaped death by the edge of the sword. Their weakness was turned to strength. They became strong in battle and put whole armies to flight. Women received their loved ones back again from the dead, but others were tortured, refusing to turn from God in order to be set free. They placed their hope in a better life after the resurrection. Some were jeered at, and their backs were cut open with whips. Others were chained in prisons. Some died by stoning. Some were sawed in half, and others were killed by, with the sword. Some went about wearing skins of sheep and goats, destitute and oppressed and mistreated. They were too good for this world, wandering over deserts and mountains, hiding in caves and holes in the ground. All these people earned a good reputation because of their faith, yet none of them received all that God has promised. Look at this list of things. That's what faith looks like. <coughs> it's not merely believing God exists and then living however you desire to. That is not the message. That's not the true God. That's not the true belief. And that's not going to get you saved. Look at them. Look at what they face. Look how they live. Look how they trust. Look how they cling to God and believed in the impossible and went through the impossible and stood by him and did not deny him because Jesus says, if you deny me, I will deny you before my father. So there will be times that he denied him. Look at Peter. He denied him three times. But what did he do? He repented. He felt sorry. He knew it was wrong. How many times do you deny for money or security or do you just believe church, that belief is on Sunday and you deny him the rest of the week by how you live it is by how you live that shows evidence that you actually belong to him if you don't belong to him even if you can say well I believe in God it's meaningless It, you should show the growth with the Holy Spirit working inside of you. It should be evident. <coughs> All right. So, uh, John 3. We've heard this many times. Oh, back to what we were saying earlier. So back to Romans, it says, uh, As Scripture say, tells us, anyone, so when it says confess with your mouth, you'll be saved. Anyone who trusts in him will never be disgraced. Trusts. Trust and believe. You believe he exists, but you're trusting him in your life, in every area of your life, to move through your life since he's living in you. Um... Jew and Gentile are the same in this respect. They have the same Lord who gives generously to all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That's through all things. And that's not just saved in eternity, but saved in every moment of life. But how can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they have never heard about him? And how can they hear about him unless someone tells them and how will anyone go and tell them and without being sent that is why the scriptures say how beautiful are the feet who bring the good news feet god will speak to us directly but <clears throat> he's gonna send people 
And so many people are like, well, I have my church. I don't need to pray with you or talk to you. I got my own area. God is going to speak through people. And, and it's how we receive them and talk to them. It, it, it's through people that he's going to reveal himself. What are you going to receive? It's blessed are the feet that bring the good news. That's all of it. It's not simple things. All right. Anyway. Um, so, to show even more. So, there, John 3, there was a man named Nicodemus, a Jewish religious leader who was a Pharisee. After dark one evening, he came to speak with Jesus. Rabbi, he said, we all know that God has sent you to teach us. Your miraculous signs are evidence that God is with you. First, the Pharisee, he's religious. He believes in God. He knows Jesus is from God. We just, he confessed that with his mouth. But what does Jesus say? Oh, okay, you're saved. Everything's all good. Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. Oh. Oh, no. But, 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 I did all these religious works and, and did all these good things and, and I know the scripture and, and all these, what? You must be born again. New creation. God sends his spirit in us. We must be born again. Being religious, believing God and doing all this. Like we said with Israel, their unbelief held them back. They didn't they actually believed in working their way to God other than the message of God and receive the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will give a new life. It's not relying on your works, but it's relying and trust <coughs> on him in you. Okay. What do you mean, exclaimed Nicodemus? How can an old man go back into his mother womb and be born again? Jesus replied, I assure you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and the Spirit. Humans can reproduce only human life, but the Holy Spirit gives birth to spiritual life. So don't be surprised when I say you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it wants, just as you can hear the word wind, but can't tell where it comes from or where it is going, so you can't explain how people are born of the Spirit. The people try to explain, well, I, I was baptized in water, so I'm born of the Spirit. No, it says you can't explain how people are born of the Spirit. Just because you get baptized in water doesn't mean you're born again this was shown with simon the sorcerer in the book of acts he was baptized and then he was trying to buy the power of the holy spirit because he was seeing what it can do and he was warned strictly that he will be put to death for that and he could repent of that but it shows strictly that there was a separate thing between baptizing water and receiving the Holy Spirit. And unless you receive the Holy Spirit and you're born again, at which you will be shown evidence through it moving through you, if you are not growing, if you are not um, overcoming these things of life, you don't have the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit is constantly working and moving in you and changing you. They claim to be religious but refuse the power that makes them godly there is a there's religion and there is being born again the holy spirit <clears throat> so further so we hear for god so loved the world he gave his only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life god sent his son into the world not to judge the world but to save the world through him. So by saying not to judge the world, it means I'm not putting everything deep to death. God could have destroyed us all because we were sinners. And that's part of the gospel message. But it was a means of saving. There is no judgment against anyone who believes in him, but their full trust in him in every area of their life. But anyone who does not believe in him 
has already been judged for not believing in God's one and only Son. And the judgment is based on this fact. God's light came into the world, but people loved the darkness more than the light, for their actions were evil. All who do evil hate the light and refuse to go near it for their sins. Fear of the sins will be exposed. So that's some evidence. There is wolves, or sheep and wolves within the church. There's wheat, wheats, and weeds when they're in the church. Sheep and goats. And in the end times, God's going to separate them. Not everybody you see is actually of the message. Some people will listen to it and do the minimal means to get to heaven. But when it comes to their direct, like calling out their sin and them having to be transformed and, and all of that stuff, they will refuse to go to that type of message because they don't want their sins exposed and their God's judgment will fall on them still. <clears throat> As it says in verse 36, And anyone who believes in God's Son has eternal life. Anyone who doesn't obey the Son will never experience eternal life, but remains under God's angry judgment. You could believe in God, but... You will remain in God's angry judgment if you don't listen to what he says. And it, and it goes with the relationship. Alright. Mark 9. So, when the dis they returned to the other disciples... They saw a large crowd surrounding them. <coughs> and some... Oh. Yeah. And some teachers of religious law were arguing with them. When the crowd saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with awe. And they ran to greet him. What is all this arguing about? Jesus asked. One of the men in the crowd spoke up and said, Teacher, I brought my son so you could heal them. He is possessed by an evil spirit that won't let him talk. And whenever this spirit seizes him, it throws him violently to the ground. Then he foams at the mouth and grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. So I asked your disciples to cast out the evil spirit, and they couldn't do it. Jesus said to them, You faithless people, how long must I be with you? How long must I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. So they brought the boy, and when the evil spirit saw Jesus, he threw the child into a violent convulsion, and he fell to the ground, wreathing and foaming at the mouth. How long has this been happening? Jesus asked the boy's father. He replied, since he was a little boy, the spirit often throws him to, into the fire and in, or into the water, trying to kill him. Have mercy on us and help us if you can. What it? Do you mean if I can't, Jesus says. Anything is possible if a person believes. The father instantly cried out, I do believe, but help me overcome my unbelief. Look, we have that belief and we have that unbelief, that constant battle. You see this? <coughs> the disciples couldn't perform this. It showed that they had little faith. So faith, like we keep saying, isn't merely believing God exists, but there's trust in it. Trusting in the authority he's given us as well. And this man, he had unbelief. He said, if I can. And Jesus didn't like that. He wants full belief on him. Trusting he can do anything and he has control of anything. And that he wants us to call upon him. And this man... He said, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. Help me overcome my unbelief. Which is something we need to cry out. Constantly. Constantly to cry out. <coughs> um, Yeah, uh, in Romans 10, it says, Dear brothers and sisters, the longing of my heart and my prayer to God is for the people of Israel to be saved. Look, 
we talked about earlier how the people of Israel was led by God and received the message and the law. But right here, Paul is sharing, my prayer and my longing is that they may be saved. Knowing God exists doesn't just get you saved. It's also wanting the desire to draw near to him. And... <coughs> <clears throat> and uh where uh also yeah I don't know where that went anyways uh let's continue sorry uh even though okay yeah I know what enthusiasm they have for God, but it is misdirected zeal. For they don't understand God's way of making people right with himself. Refusing to accept God's way, they cling to their own way of getting right with God. By trying to keep the law. They tried to keep the law. Again, like I said, it is misdirected zeal. And it says that they are not saved. But they... Yeah... They were making their own way of reaching God that they cling to. They refuse God's way. And if we refuse God's way, even if we believe in God, that's not going to get us saved. Anyway, for Christ has already accomplished the purpose for which the law has given us. Given as a result, all who believe in him are made right with God. So God, Christ fulfilled the purpose of the law. And in him, he can work the law in us. If, if we put our trust in him, he's going to move it through us. It's not by us that we can do it, but we trust in him to move it through us. Okay. And, and that goes further. Uh, the, another misconception with that, John fifteen sixteen. You didn't choose me. I chose you. I appointed you to go and produce lasting fruit, so that the Father will give you whatever you ask for in using my name. So... We, first off, didn't choose him. He chose us. And it was to appoint us to go and produce fruit. We were chosen for others to go share that message. And if this evidence is not going through, if this works is not going through us, we might want to question our, our, our walk and the reality. Uh, am I saved? Truly. That the Father will give you whatever you ask for using my name. Um, <clears throat> just a minute. Um, yeah, and and what that's getting into is actually. Uh, Produce fruit to do God's will using His name. Um, that the Father will give you whatever you ask for using my name. So He's producing the fruit, He's connecting it. He says, I'm producing this so that the Father will give you. Um, and, and it's a constant, like, I'm living out what He wants, He and, and and it, he's Jesus is sharing, you know, asking the Father, okay, what do I need to do in this person's life? How do I produce this fruit? And he's giving us that words. And prayer should get into this seeking God's will like Jesus showed us. <coughs> um, Hebrews 3, it says, Be careful then, dear brothers and sisters. Make sure that your hearts are not evil and unbelieving, turning you away from the living God. You must warn each other every day while they're still today. People are like, that's between me and God. But this is, warn each other every day while it's still today so that none of you will be deceived by God and hardened against God. For if we are faithful to the end, trusting in God just as firmly as when we first believed, we will share in all that belongs to Christ. And in 19, so we see, and let's talk about Israel. So we see that because of their unbelief, they were not able to enter his rest. 
little side note there. Um, <clears throat> and then Matthew 24 shares, As Jesus was leaving the temple ground, his disciples pointed out to him the various temple building, but buildings. But he responded, Do you see all these buildings? I tell you the truth. They will not be... They will be completely demolished. Not one stone will be left on top of one another. So they're marveling at these synagogues and these temples, which we do also. And we think these are a part of our belief system. But Jesus tore down the old system. Understand this. He, and this is why the Pharisees, part of what he wanted to kill him, they said that he's going to destroy the temple in three days it's going to rise again, right? That's what he's saying right here. And we want to live by this temple system. We're stuck in that system, the old system. But, you know, he says not a single stone will be upon one another. But what does he say what the temple is now? He says we are the temple. We are the living stones being stacked upon one another. Um, so he took down the old system that's, that's built by buildings and structure. And these tore down buildings. And now we become the stones being built. It's not based on which building you go to. Rather, it's within the thrones of him and the thrones of our heart. And we should be built upon each other. And we should recognize each other as the living stone and being stacked and closer to one another. And that should be an evident that, that God is truly in us. How we receive people even if... We're not within the same area, but we receive them. Uh, <coughs> and then Jesus is, is going further in verse 9. He's talking more in end times, what, what's going to happen. And also, like I said, if you receive this, you know God's working in your heart and you have a seed and you're born again. When you accept these things. Anyway. Um, then you will be arrested, persecuted, and killed. You will be hated all over the world. Because you are my followers. And many will turn away from me. And betray and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear. And will deceive many people. Sin will be rampant everywhere. And the love of many will grow cold but the one who endures to the end will be saved the evidence that they are growing in and, and they truly believe and trust in Christ they're, and, and they'll be hated and betrayed and persecuted and killed and, and their life will be in constant danger and there will be false prophets obviously there's false people of God and we need to understand that not every message is a true message of God not everyone who talks about God is of God. Anyways, so sin will run a bit. Their love will go curled. And, and if we endure to the end, that shows evidence that we are born again. <clears throat> it's not merely that we claim it. But if we claim it through all these hardships and suffering, I tell you, and that shows, okay, this is my child. Who am I and well pleased? Um, <coughs> and John 20 says this is after Jesus was resurrected and came and visited the disciples look at this eight days later the disciples were together again and this time Thomas was with them look he waited for a specific time to reveal himself to, to a specific person who had trouble still believing. Anyway, um, the doors were locked, but suddenly, as Jesus was standing among them, Peace be with you, he said. Then he said to Thomas, Put your fingers here and look at my hands, but your hand, put your hand into the wound in my side. Don't be faithless any longer. Believe my Lord and my God. Or believe. My Lord and my God, Thomas exclaimed. 
Jesus came eight days later to have an intimate moment with Thomas. And he revealed himself in such a way to get him to believe. And we must pray and ask God. That if we just have these ideas of what God is like and all these. And, and we don't actually have this personal relationship and understanding through our relationship. And everything we say and think is just based off what the church has told us. You know, there, there might not be, you might not be born again. <coughs> It's all these ideas in our old self. But he and we need to pray for all people that they that Jesus will come into their life and show them a personal moment with them. He will reveal himself to his chosen in an intimate moment to show the reality of who he is and that he is worth every moment of your life. Not just, well, the Christians shouldn't just talk about it all the time. I and mean, God doesn't want that. Uh, he bought us with the high price every moment. We don't belong to ourselves. He is all about the Father's business and being spoken about. That's what life should be about. Anyways. <coughs> 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 So he has this personal moment which we all must desire. And he will give us. People say, uh, Jesus loves me, yes I know, for the Bible tells me so. And that's good for a child. And that's good for us to, to see. But we don't have to live by because the Bible tells me so. He, we can seek an intimate relationship and presence where we can feel him and know. And that's full about belief. Christ lives in me. I can feel it. I know it. I've called upon him in troubled times, in possible situations, and he has never failed me. And I've grown trust, even in areas where I expected to die. I've grown trust through it, like Paul says, um, to rely on him more. That is, is not just because the Bible tells me so. It is becoming my reality, and I can show it, and I can have a testimony of it. He wants to reveal ourselves and himself in such an intimate way in our relationship with him. That's part of the belief. That's part of the gospel. He wants to live in us. He chose to. That's part of his sacrifice so he can transform us. Then Jesus told him, you believe because you have seen me. <coughs> 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 Blessed are those who believe without seeing me. Whereas they believe. <laughs> <coughs> but it took a while. I mean, they had so many times where Jesus was like, you faithless people. You faithless people. How much longer do I have to deal with you faithless people? He desires us to grow in faith. But he felt and had this moment and he believed. And they followed him. And they rose again and they believed. But how blessed are we if we believe him in and everything he says without seeing him physically. He will show us intimately. Okay, let's continue. The disciples saw Jesus do many other miracles and signs. Miraculous signs, in addition to the ones recorded in this book. But these are written so that you may continue to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. So, these are, everything is written. So we may continue to believe in Jesus. So we, so not just believing he exists, but everything recorded in the book, uh, and these miraculous things that, that are beyond our imagination. That's what's going to get us to, to, to truly believe and to grow and continue uh, the impossible. Okay. And that by believing in him, you will have life by the power of his name. Life. 
We don't have life without Christ. He is the way, truth, and life. That's why He desires all this. All this is written so we can have life. That connects with that message, death wears you sting. It says that we are without life, but we breathe in, you know, what He breathed out. And we put it in our lungs, and we have life. And we don't have to worry about anything or death. We, all these people who, who were salt and half and went through this, this, and that for their faith, looking for something further, they knew their life was in Christ. They weren't worried about focusing on this life, but the next. Christ is life. By the power of His name. All of this, as you study this, as you look in this, as you look at Scripture, as you start furthering your belief rather than just settling with, well, I believe in God, that's enough. So do demons. They are not my brothers and sisters in Christ. They are not going to be in heaven with me. They come to kill, steal, and destroy. Look more into just believing. You don't want to be told I never knew you. Gee, Satan has a counterfeit of everything that God has. He makes everything look realistic. To what God has for us. So we settle on that. And never have the real thing. And never go into true life. And not enter into heaven. Because he wants us to settle with this fake. Unexistent. Version of belief. This fake. Unexistent. Version of love. Of joy of peace these things where we think okay I have this I'm good but then the end, time, end of days come judgment day comes sorry you had it wrong you had the counterfeit version look into it now make sure and see the evidence flowing through your life. Flowing through others' life. It's not going to look like an average human. You're going to see God in them. Let's pray. Father God, we just seek to know you truly, the true you, not the created one that everybody tries to tell us about. <coughs> Not one that suits our life and our pleasures, but we seek to know the true you. That's what we need to confess. The true Lord, not one that people created, not one that's just created by human understanding and means, but the true God, we desire you. There are many idols. We ask that we destroy the idols in our life. We ask to grow fruit. We ask that we remain in you. We ask that we live by true faith. I just ask that this message was for me too, that, that you would further help me through my unbelief. And that, that you help me overcome what's not of you and me and that I grow and I just pray this for all people in Jesus name I pray amen alright brothers sisters have a good night love you bye